So just to give you guys a few highlights on the Fantagis brand, we have invested over £130,000 into the platform, which is fucking crazy to say out loud, but we have. And I mean, it might sound like a lot, but really in the, in the scheme of what we are trying to do and the landscape of startups and scalable businesses, it's nothing really. We haven't raised a whole lot. We get turned away by a lot of investors just because we are not raising enough money. So it's chump change. And we have over 125,000 influencers on our network. Plus, we've got over 8 million download alerts set to go out when we complete development on our iOS and Android platforms. We also have interest from the likes of Sony, Warner, SoundCloud, Spotify, Universal, and loads of other brands, businesses, talent agencies that are interested in using this type of tool. As a lot of you are probably aware, I've been working on an app for some time now. Fantagious is my little baby. I've literally put everything I have into this platform because I believe in it so much and because I believe I can see something that not everybody else can see. So even though the app is not officially out on the app store and we've been working with different betas and blah, 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 we still covered quite a lot of stuff and we've gone through a load of ups and downs that I think could be quite cool to share with you guys especially those who have been following us from the very beginning so this series is this mini series is gonna be a little history lesson on the platform where it all came from how it came to be how we raised our first bit of money and all the rest of it so today Fantagious is a talent discovery and talent marketing tool designed for musicians content creators influencers and for the talent industries which benefit from those type of creators. So we've built a place where creators can grow their audience by cross promoting with other similar creators. And we've also built a place where creators can get discovered by brands, record labels, talent scouts. So episode one is called An Idea Is Born and it's gonna go right back to the beginning with me quitting my job and leaving, not knowing what I was gonna do, dabbling around in a load of stuff and then completely diverting my focus in the accomplishment of this particular goal we've had to overcome a lot and considering none of us had ever like none of us had built an app before i had no idea what i was doing in the beginning and i was just fumbling around making a complete mess which you will find out in the course of the story where to begin where to begin the beginning beginning of everything so back when i was 18 years old this is back in like 2008 Yeesh, that's a long time ago. I started working in Tiger Tiger. So I've always been around like bar work. I did a bit of modeling, done like London Fashion Week and all that kind of stuff. And then a few years later, I found out I was gonna be a dad at like 21 years old. So now I can no longer do the bar work and the nighttime stuff. So I had to go find myself a real job. So within the company, the same company as Tiger Tiger, I started working as a senior sales exec. One evening when I had finished work, I ended up getting in a conversation with these guys. They said they really liked the way I build rapport and they offered me a job in City Point Tower. So I'd work as an investment broker. I ended up moving to an insurance broker job and this was my last job. I left probably in about 2014, 2015, something like that. So I was at work. I remember seeing this article on LinkedIn and it was like 24 reasons you might be an entrepreneur. And I read it and I was just like, tick, 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 that is me. So then I um, started doing these UFC fight night parties in London. This was something that me and my friends used to stay up and watch these UFC events every time there was a title fight. People would always end up falling asleep because we weren't doing a lot. We would be chilling, waiting for this fight to come on in Vegas. I was started thinking like it would be really good if we could go out because if we're partying, we can stay up till three in the morning easy. So we started doing our own fight night parties in London and we had help from UFC, like they tweeted us out. We had a few events, but just because of the way the MMA scene was quite frowned upon at the time, we kept getting our events shut down. And our last event was at Playboy Club and they shut us down like the day before the event or something. And it was just a joke. Like I had UFC fighter agents coming down and they, they shut us down. It was just a shit show. So after that, I just kind of thought, well, we got into a little dispute with Playboy. They ended up paying us because of the 
inconvenience severe inconvenience and then after that we thought like this is just too much stress so we stopped doing the events and then during this time this is probably like 2016 or something like that i started going to the studio with a friend of mine george who is now signed to emi at the time he was working on a project and i would tag along with him and this is where i started learning a lot of my foundational music knowledge and i've always had a passion for music but i never pushed myself down any particular path during school i was just playing football so i started really thinking how could artists like this promote themselves without any money and without having like a record label or whatever to back them i started brainstorming these ideas on how we could potentially help i arrived at this concept where i thought if we went on social media and we found i think george probably had like maybe a thousand followers 700 followers at the time he wasn't as big as he is now i thought to myself like if we went online and we found loads of people who have around a thousand followers that do similar kind of music and we created like a big group we could all promote each other because obviously George's fans would probably like the music of one of the other people that he promotes and everyone could kind of share fans between each other in order to level themselves up. And when I started looking around at how we could potentially do this, I started going on SoundCloud, Twitter, Instagram, and even back then, all they would do is suggest all these people that have like 20K, 15K. So we weren't finding the people that we needed and it wasn't efficient enough. So I started thinking it'd be really good if there was an app that could just filter this entire social internet and just make everything easier to get to. So somebody with 50K can find everyone else who has 50K who does a similar genre of music to them. So you've got a grime artist with 20K, he can match with loads of other grime artists who have 20K. And with this, they could collaborate on projects or they could just shout each other out, promote each other's work, just follow each other and engage in each other's content to help it perform better on the Instagram algorithm. So there were so many little things that we could do in order to boost ourselves, but we needed the tool in order to do it. A few more brainstorms later and I've got the bare bones of an app. It's starting to take a little bit of shape at this point. After a few more hours, I've got something that feels solid. It feels like I could sell it. So now I'm thinking to myself, okay, cool. I've got this good idea. It's solid. I'm going to take this to Sony Music or whoever, and they're going to give me loads of money and I'll be rich and live happily ever after. Wrong. Wrong. With my old job as a broker, my role was to set up new business for my directors. So these were like quite big companies that I needed to get into. So I needed to get past the, the gatekeepers, basically. So the people who are supposed to stop sales calls from getting through, I needed to get past them to get to the key decision makers so I could tell them about the amazing service that I was about to offer them. So I got really good at getting emails for whoever I needed to talk to. Rather than going through like info at, I would go straight to the person I needed. Now there's various ways I would do this. I won't go into it, but th th there's loads of ways. And I've decided I'm gonna take this to like one of the top developers in Silicon Valley, one of the top developers in New York and to Sony Music. I sent out this one pager, which basically summarized this app, which at the time was called Songtagus and not Fantagus. So it was only for musicians at the time. And sure enough, I got a response from everyone. The most interesting was Sony. Like this is a senior, this is a director at Sony that I've messaged. They've messaged back like, this is great. We would love to see it. Where is it? And now I'm like, uh, uh, kind of haven't built it. We're just, this is just an idea on paper. So they were kind of like, okay, well, we don't really fuck with ideas on paper. You need to have at least a beta built before we can talk to you. So now I'm starting to realize something. A very key lesson is that ideas are not worth jack shit like nobody fucking cares this was like one of the first lessons i learned it's all about your execution so they want to see that you can do it so now it's kind of dawning on me that i'm gonna have to build this thing and i've never done anything like this at this point all i've done is some private events in london and sold fucking insurance and been an investment broker and worked in a bar this is all the experience I have at this point. I've got a lot of raw intelligence, don't get it twisted, but in terms of experience doing something like this, I had absolutely none. And now it's dawning on me that I'm going to have to build this thing if I want it to come to life. So at this point, I'm still trying to do this on my own. I want to find a developer. I mean, I remember there was a brief moment where I kind of looked at how to become a developer, but that was just too long. So I went online, started looking for developers who could work with us, maybe take like a, a percentage of the company in order to build an early version of the app. But you got to understand like this app is very complicated and I don't even understand the depths of how complicated this app is. So we're approaching people and we're not getting anywhere. 
Later on, I found out developers are a very particular kind of people. They were, I was told that developers are like mercenaries, meaning like you, you need to pay them. They're not going to work for the cause, basically. Around this time, I've also brought in one of my close friends, Carl, who I made my COO. So he was helping me now and it was good to have that support. So at this point, we've spoken to a couple of developers. We got introduced to somebody that said he could do it and was very confident, gassed himself up. And then they all just disappeared. I don't even know. I can't remember what happened to all of them, but somewhere along the line, they stopped delivering and they disappeared. So now we've kind of come to this firm decision that we are going to have to raise some money so at this point like i've got ideas drawn out on paper so these are like app screens basically labeled up to show what button would go where what what would do what so what i found was that even some of the bigger companies that i contacted because i had a good idea and because i went to like a key decision maker i would get little pieces of advice back so somebody said to me we needed a prototype we didn't need to build a whole beta we could just build a prototype I didn't know what the fuck this was. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Obviously, I don't have the money to spend, what, five grand on a prototype. So now I've had to learn how to do this myself. Oh, one thing I didn't mention. So I have experience with graphics design and stuff like that as well. Small experience, self-taught. Now I'm a bit better because obviously I've had to do this and I've probably built like nine, ten different prototypes over the years. But we needed a prototype at this point and I just started studying how to do it. I used a platform called Sketch, which is one of my favorite apps on the Mac. It is incredible design tool, very efficient, lightweight, just does what it needs to do. I love it. I use that to build our prototype. So essentially taking the screens that I had drawn, which are called wireframes, and I've and I've created a prototype from that, which you can load up on your phone and click through it as if it was a real app. Now, this is where people started to look a bit closely at what we were doing, but still nobody really gave a shit. I finished making our first version and I found a book called The Art of Startup Fundraising. And this was one of the real game changers for me because this helped me look at things in a very different light. It helped me strategize who we were going to approach and how we were going to approach them, what type of funding was available to us and things like that. So I've, if anyone's trying to raise money, like I definitely recommend you read that book. One of the things I learned was that we needed to put together an advisory board. These were people who knew more than us because we didn't have the experience amongst ourselves. We had the vision, the passion, the, the, the tenacity, but we didn't have the experience, especially on a project of this scale. So we went out and started meeting people and recruiting them as advisors on the platform. So we give them like a small piece of equity ranging from like 0.5% to 2% depending on their skill set and what they could potentially bring to the table. And the idea was that they would provide us with advice and any contacts that could help strengthen the platform. And we would give them an ownership stake in the platform in exchange for this. At this point, we've also brought in our CMO and CFO to help us with our marketing schedules and our financial projections. This is where the team is starting to kind of take shape. We had it in our mind that we were gonna go and raise a million pound. So we thought we we're gonna take this, we're gonna raise a million pound. That will give us the money we need for, for a 12 months runway. And we were gonna absolutely kill this. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> Wrong again. <laughs> As we started approaching these VCs and investors to raise this one million pounds, we soon realized that this shit was not gonna happen. We were trying to raise too much. We could possibly, quite possibly, and I mean, it would be very ambitious, but we could argue a one million pound valuation at this point with what we had. It would be a tough argument, but we could argue it. So if we were to raise one million pounds, on a company with a one million pound valuation, we would essentially be giving up 100% of the company, right? So that shit got shut down real quick and then we had to go back to the drawing board again. So we decided to lower our ask. I think we were going in for about 70,000 pounds. We knew to build the app in the UK was gonna cost us like 120K per platform. So 120K iOS, 120K Android. One of our partners, P Cloud, I've been talking to them from a very early stage. They recommended we go where they were in Bulgaria and build our app out there. So at this point, we've created a new pitch deck. We've got a new business plan. We've got a new strategy. We're going to try and raise about 70 to 100,000 pounds. We went out and started approaching investors. And soon after that, we ran into our next big problem. You see, it's easier to raise money for something that already exists because there's something to compare it to. You can try and start another hotel and say, these are the hotel figures for this particular area. So we think that we could take this much of this particular market. And you can see that the hotels in this area do X, Y, Z. So we will be competing within this. 
you can do all that when something exists. When something doesn't exist, you're comparing pieces of it to other things that kind of resemble what you're trying to do. So investors, they want to minimize their risk. And the fact that we had something that didn't exist, it came across as a risky investment to a lot of people who looked at it. Plus, we were only trying to raise 70 to 100K. So like I said, a lot of investors, they don't give a shit. It's like, it's too little. You need to, I can show you hundreds of emails where they're basically like, you need to come back when you're raising above a million pounds. The tricky spot we were in is that we had something that didn't exist and we were trying to raise the kind of money that people weren't really trying to give out. This is like angel investor type money, not investor money. So in order to prove the concept would work, we started holding our own focus groups in central London where we invited artists to come down and fill out surveys and learn about the platform. So the feedback was really good. A lot of people were looking for a solution to this problem. Not long after this, we decided to hold our first board meeting where we invited the entire advisory board and senior management into central London to have a more like an update kind of meeting where we bring everyone up to speed with what's been going on, what we're trying to do next. Now, on this particular day, there was one person, one of the, the advisory board guys who had come, who we were very happy was there. Anyway, during the meeting now, I, I said something that one of the other advisory board members kind of challenged me on and a couple other people challenged me on, cer on certain parts of my presentation and I just handled everything like at this point I've been doing this for 12 months so to me it was all like second nature I could in fact, probably even longer than that maybe 18 to 24 months I've been learning how to create prototypes gain investors and do all these kinds of things so it's been a long process of me just educating myself even on the industry itself that I was about to walk into, I knew my stuff. So when I was challenged, I kind of held it up and defended every point. I didn't need to surrender any ground. It was, it just went well. And then afterwards we went to the pub. The guy I said I was happy to have at the meeting, he pulled me to the side and basically said, God, okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. What's the Everybody procedure, stay everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay calm. The four most beautiful words an entrepreneur can hear. I want to in best so right after we've kind of secured this investment we basically secured about seventy thousand pound it was supposed to come in two separate parts so we had to go to bulgaria we were going to build part of the app come back we needed to have a few partnerships and strengthen the platform to some degree and then we were going to secure another i think another 35 grand so it was going to be like 70k in two parts so first thing we did we got in touch with the developers we had been speaking to, they were a company called Exedia. They're one of the top developers out in Bulgaria. So we started talking to them. We got everything sorted out. We got the pricing and all that kind of stuff. And then we secured the money. At this point, I don't even have a bank account. I don't have ID, I don't have a passport, nothing. Like literally these past few years, as much as the first half of this series makes it sound like I was just plodding away, working hard. Like it was very difficult. There was a lot of low times. I was very much like a hermit. I just stayed in my room and I worked. I didn't have many social interactions. I didn't talk to a lot of people, nothing. Like literally I was single for a good few years, had nothing, did nothing. So I was living on the bare minimum, just literally scraping by. And now I'm about to fly to Bulgaria and I have nothing in place. So this week leading up to us leaving, I was just banging out everything, like trying to get my ID, fast tracking my passport, trying to get my bank account open. And then literally on the day of us leaving, like, we didn't even have any computers or nothing. Like I had to get, we bought our Macs on the day of our flight. We literally were in the Apple store in Bromley, picked up our Macs and then we were running to the car to get to the airport in time for our trip. So um, yeah, it was very, very hectic period, but it was sick. Like I said, I've been in my room for years before this. And then now all of a sudden I'm, jumping on the plane to go and fly to Bulgaria and build the app which I've been working on for the past like year and a half or whatever so that was huge like I mean I can't even describe how sick that feeling was and it's still one of my best experiences to date the whole thing from start to finish was just sick the guy that we met out there so he's a friend of my COO's dad and he has his own company out there. I mean, I won't go into too much detail about who he is and stuff, but he was just a G. When we were flying there, he knew all the people, like we got taken through customs. We had, um, like we got picked up by an Escalade. We had security out there. It was just, it was fucking sick. Anything we needed, it was sorted. There's loads of other stuff, but we probably can't talk about it on here. But yeah, it, it was, it was sick. Anywho, 
first day we've started development everything's going well we got to see around their offices like their offices are incredible like a proper you felt like you were in a tech how you see like the google campus and things like that like they had playstations they had like a bar and um yeah the people there were really nice they're really good at what they do they helped us build a really cool platform and the cool thing about bulgaria is that it's so cheap in terms of value for money like you can get so much for your money if you go on a trip to bulgaria like to give you an idea of the cost i mean for for the for two of us to live in bulgaria for a month eat pay for our accommodation pay for our travel pay for the development all that stuff was cheaper than doing it over here and i flew back after two weeks so i had to do the school run so i literally i had to fly back after two weeks i flew back on the first day or something picked up my daughter on friday and then flew back on sunday and carried on development so it was a very honestly it's a crazy time like sickest sickest experience ever your money literally doubles up out there so if you if you take out a thousand pounds you've essentially got two thousand um what's their money called again what is bulgarian currency called Lev, Lev. So like, yeah, a thousand pound probably get you like 2,000 Lev. And the food out there is cheap. Internet out there is fast. The shopping centers are wicked. So now we've kind of come into the end of our period in Bulgaria. We've been there for nearly a month. We've been building the app and things are coming along very well. We're excited to get back and get to work. But towards the end of development, when we're getting the bill, the app this is when we've run into our next problem and when i made my next big mistake God, if you listen hell Preaching, look at him. Huh? I'm in a cab, you know. Why are you filming me? <laughs> Just dog. Look at this guy. What are you filming me for? Yo. 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 I've realized that I didn't account for tax. So we're about seven grand short. And I mean, the money we have left is literally me and Carl's wages. So we don't actually know exactly when the next funding will come in. We needed a little bit of cash to help us get by and kind of see this period through. And now we've had to give it all up in order to pay this final bill. So we've come back to the UK with no money. But at the same time, we're also kind of happy because we know we got our next stage of funding coming in. So we've got back, we've done our reports for our investors, we sent them off. And then the guy who basically pulled me aside at that meeting, he emailed me. So this was our lead investor. He was the guy who kind of was making everything happen. There was another investor there, but we didn't get to speak to him. He's kind of big in the game. So yeah, the lead investor has sent me an email basically saying that he's having some personal problems like family issues and he's gonna have to pull out of the investment. So we've come back, we've got no money and now we just found out that the next stage of funding that we were gonna get is not actually coming anymore. What the fuck is this? Whose ass didn't I kiss? Carl's left his job. Like before we went to Bulgaria, he quit his job to do this. Like we were gonna do this properly, full time. We thought that we've got two stages of fun and we got 70K, what could possibly go wrong? So like I said a few episodes ago, I was really good at getting people's email addresses. So even though we didn't get to speak to this guy, I thought I'm just gonna shoot. I'm just gonna try and contact him and see what happens. This was do or die for us at this point. So I decided that I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna be persistent and I'm gonna push until I get what I need. So I kind of made peace with the idea in my head that he is either going to tell me yes or he's going to tell me to fuck off. And I was completely fine with the um, with both outcomes, basically. It was just, yeah, it was do or die at this point. I had to make something happen. So I started sending him proposals. He turned down loads of them. But um, eventually I managed to get him to give me, it was like more of a personal investment into myself. I made a proposal for him to invest in me. I said like, I am gonna do this. I am passionate, I am driven. I know what I'm doing, I have a plan. So invest in me. So I managed to get him to give me 
20K. This wasn't enough for us to go back to Bulgaria and build what we had been building already. So I had to find another developer that was gonna work for cheap. And instead of building an iOS and Android app, we were gonna build a web app. So just something that you load up on a browser. It would work on your phone, just as it would work on a desktop computer, but there's no dedicated app. So we built this, we started doing our testing. If you go on the Fantages profile, on our highlights, we've got a, um, I think it's the founding users highlight. And everyone in there is one of our founding users who signed up to the early, early app testing, our very first beta test. So once we gathered all that testing data, we managed to prove the concept would work. We managed to prove that people actually saw growth and that it was the kind of growth that was sustainable and organic as well. So we took this data and we started approaching investors again. And then around this time, there was an app called Captivate on the iPhone. And basically what it would allow you to do, it was a growth tool, an automated growth tool for Instagram. So what it would do is it would follow a load of people and then it would unfollow everyone who didn't follow you back and it would do it automatically. Now this was honestly so such a great tool. So I only got to use it for about two weeks. And in that two weeks, I was gaining around a thousand followers a week on both pages. And then after this two week period, Instagram made some updates to their platform, which basically locked out all of these growth tools. Now, after they did this, obviously everyone who was using these tools no longer has a tool that they can use in order to grow. So we had a load of YouTubers, Instagram creators, influencers, all reaching out to us, basically saying like, when is something like this gonna work for us? So we always had this in our plan. Like I was gonna do it was going to be something like maybe separate apps so it'd be one for like music one for filmmakers one for photographers that kind of thing but when we had these people messaging us i started thinking like it would be really good if we could have everybody under one roof and at the time i was going out with a youtuber and i remember she used to complain all the time about the fact that her music used to get flagged for copyright, even though she was paying for the license to be able to use this music. Which led me to start thinking that artists are always looking for promotion for their music and YouTubers are always looking for music for their videos. So if we were to put everybody under one roof, there are so many different collaborations that could take place across crafts and across genres. And then again, after a few brainstorms, I've got a whole new app called Fantages. And obviously we had to redo everything. So the business plan had to change. The pitch deck had to change. So we've put all this together, packaged it up and we've started to approach investors. Now we've got like 10 investors interested, about two of them that I'd say are very close to possibly making an offer. And just as we were setting meetings, so we set meetings with two investors and we had about seven or eight other meetings that we needed to line up. Just as we were doing this, I'm saying we were days away. COVID hit, everything was locked down and investors immediately pulled back and we couldn't get hold of anyone. So now I'm really thinking that we are dead in the water. Dun, dun, dun. So COVID hit, our investors have done a runner. We don't know what the fuck is happening next and the whole thing is just looking like a mess. So I've had to go back to my strategy from the previous episode where I just decided in my head that I'm gonna go at everybody and I'm gonna be persistent and I'm gonna be annoying and I'm not gonna stop until I get a yes or they tell me to literally get out of here. Get out of here, man! Shit, I'm saying! Went back to the drawing board. I didn't know what the fuck was gonna happen next. Everything was just looking like a fucking joke. Like, this was, it, it was just done as far as I was concerned. Like, I was at that point where I thought that I'm out of moves now. Like, I have nothing else I can play. And the promise I made to myself at the start of this journey was that I'd have to do this until, like, the idea dies or I die. There is no fucking way I'm coming out of this unless one of the two happens. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you think that's necessary? So whenever it gets to a point where things are getting on top, I always try and think of my next moves. But when I get to a point where I have no moves in the tank, that's when I become the most worried. That's when it's like, okay, we might have to call it quits now. So a couple of weeks have gone by and I'm in this survival mode where I'm basically hassling everybody, trying to get anything we possibly can. And in the end, we got a little break. The same investor who I was bothering last time who gave us the 20K, we managed to get him to invest another piece of money. Plus we were able to get more funds from other sources. And then in the end, we ended up with 80,000 pounds. So now we finally raised capital above 100,000 pounds. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. Like to this day, I, it still hasn't sunk in. But at the same time, it's like when you're in it, you realize how small that amount is. Like I said, these investors do not want to give out this kind of money. It's too small for them. Anyway, so we've raised the money now. The first thing in my mind is that I am not going to get caught by this bullshit again. So my first plan of action is 
as soon as I got this 80K, this is obviously around the time when I've moved here. So if you haven't seen the video where I surprised my daughter with the apartment, because I was sharing a room at my mum's, everything was a bit um, chaotic. This became like my office slash studio slash home. And yeah, there's a video of me surprising my daughter with this place and it is on my YouTube. So make sure you go check it out when you get a chance. But as I'm moving here, the one thing that is going through my head is that we have been caught too many times with our trousers down. So I am not gonna allow this to happen again. My first plan of action is that even though we've got 80 grand in the tank, I'm not gonna wait for this 80 grand to run out. I am gonna go in and I'm gonna raise another 200K, okay? This is my plan, because I'm thinking, we've had this happen before. We've had this thing where we run out of money and I'm stressed and I'm panicking and I think everything's gonna go to shit. So this time we are not gonna allow that to happen. One of our other potential investors, he introduced me to a company called Crowdcube. Now, a lot of you guys are gonna know about this Crowdcube thing, not the whole story, but you're gonna definitely know that we were doing something with Crowdcube and then it suddenly disappeared. Well, <laughs> So yeah, we've linked up with Crowdcube. They've signed us up to the platform. Everything is looking good. I'm thinking this time I'm not gonna get caught. But sure enough, the universe has its own way of showing you that you are not in control. And this next curveball that we got hit with was the biggest and the worst of the whole journey so far. Like this. I mean, I literally, I cried there, like real fucking tears. And I was saying, I have not got it in me anymore to do this. I cannot do it. I don't have anything left. You sound like a... Like a little bitch. We've signed up to the Crowdcube thing, giving them all our company information, giving them our pitch decks, our promo stuff. I've never been put under this much scrutiny in my entire life. Because this is the first time I had ever done a crowdfund, they recommended a company to us called Overfund who would manage our entire campaign. So I'm thinking, obviously, I'm trying to not leave anything to chance right now because I've done all this chaos before. So I paid the company because six grand plus tax. Now this process should only take about two, three months and they have a million investors who they're gonna send your investment opportunity out to and you have a very good chance of raising the money. Now you can raise over your money but you can't raise under your money. So you have to give them a target. You have to hit the target. They recommended we go in for about 400K, but I wanted to go in for 200K just to be safe because I wanted to hit the target. And then obviously if we hit 200K, we can still overfund to 400K. So a couple months have gone by now and we haven't really made a whole lot of progress. I'm kind of chasing them down, wondering what's going on. They're ignoring us. And this goes on for a little while. And then eventually I get a letter in the post from an accountancy company and they are handling the liquidation of overfund. So this company that we've paid three, three and a half grand to manage our campaign, they have just gone out of business basically. And the worst part about this letter is they're not telling us, oh, we didn't offer you the service. So we're going to give you your three grand back. They are asking for the remaining three and a half grand that I was supposed to pay at the end of the job. So I've kind of flipped out and I'm like, yo, you guys are taking the absolute piss. I will not ask again. Pay me my money. <laughs> well, I'm sure my people will be in cash. I'm still waiting for this money to this day. They, they haven't paid us. I had to take over the whole crowdfund now, something I'd never done and I'm taking it over at the end. So we are pressed for time. Now money is actually running out. Everything I was trying to avoid is now happening right before my eyes and I can't do anything to stop it. So we're dealing with compliance now. As I'm submitting all our pieces of evidence, they're all getting approved. We're doing great. Like everything is going through perfectly. Then a few weeks later, maybe a week later, suddenly all the approvals are getting rejected. So I'm thinking something is definitely going on so i've contacted them and it turns out the member of the compliance team who was looking over our stuff in the beginning who was approving everything was taken off our case basically and we were given someone else and this woman was just being <sighs> okay okay let's just take some deep breaths keep it together she was being a nuisance basically so everything that had been approved she was now rejecting it so it didn't really make sense why she was and we were getting into a few like back and forth and a few disagreements about how we should present the pitch this was not something that i was just plucking out of my own brain i was speaking to other members of the crowdcube team and they were in firm agreement with what i was saying so it was literally this one woman who was being like this lone wolf and in the end i thought we had reached an agreement we had gone to all our investors to say that we are about to be on crowdcube so don't invest in us this way you're going to invest in us on this platform everything was looking great as we are about to get our share price i get an email from crowdcube saying that they're disqualifying us 
obviously it's something to do with my disagreement with this woman. So they made us go to all our investors and kind of warm them up to this crowdfund. And then they, we were still, it was still possible to disqualify us. I wouldn't have cared if they kicked us out because we could have gone straight to our investors and said, like, we're doing a funding round now. Or do you want to get involved and just raise the money how we have been raising the money this whole time? Now everyone's kind of looking for the crowdfund and saying we've been disqualified. It just looks like shit. So no matter what the reason is, they are not going to care. I didn't know what we were going to do. Yeah, we were back to square one, couldn't raise any money. So like I said, when that email came in, I literally cried. I rang my girlfriend at the time. She cried, I cried, fucking, I've been working on this for 12 months. And obviously I've been working on this for years before this. And I had already dealt with a load of ups and downs and 12 months work just got taken away like that, like just wiped clean. This is the time more than all the other times that I really thought that we were done. I started going online looking at different possibilities, trying to look at like bounce back loans and grants and all these kind of things, these other potential routes for funding. I applied to so many different things, which is also how I applied to this Barclays Accelerator program is that I was just looking for any option to save us. And I ended up finding this startup loan. I applied to that and we ended up securing another 25K, which is where we are right now. And obviously we're on this Barclays Accelerator program. We have the opportunity to raise some money at the end of it. And we're gonna see how everything goes, I guess. Like this is all unfolding. We are currently, like where we are now in this story is basically at the present. Obviously 25K is not a whole lot of money and it's not gonna last us a whole lot of time. So who knows where we are gonna be in a few months time. I might be back on this camera crying about a worse rock bottom than the one that we've just been at. I just really wanted to say thank you to everyone who has watched the series, who has just been supporting the series, sending me messages. Like, I appreciate every single one of you and I really wanted to tell this story to um, bring you guys up to speed as to where we are today. Something new coming soon, I think you guys are going to love it and I'm very grateful for the support so far. Peace.